Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. When we aren't afraid of death, we are less afraid of life. From these episodes, I aim for all of us, this is myself included, to go after our dreams, have great relationships, and a lot of joy in the process. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today we have Deirdre Trudeau. Deirdre is an expressive fine artist, owner and creative of Easy Eye Imaging and eZones.biz, an innovative design and marketing company that influences success with intelligent creativity. She's a fun gal. She is a speaker, author, mentor of success and founder of what she calls the she fluence factor which helps you to tap into the powerful she economy by reaching out with effective brand presence that fully engages meaningful connections and powers lasting results um, she's also the co-founder of women's success today is an executive team speaker with celestial pardon me, with Solutions for Life, taking charge with your self-care, health care, and wealth care. She's a pretty cool lady. Anyways, Deirdre Trudeau, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. This is an absolute thrill to, to cover this kind of topic and information. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. And it's so interesting because we've had guests that are um, people that have had near-death experiences who have books and they're they're in that world. And what I love is also bringing people that have, um, I don't want to say regular jobs because you are pretty extraordinary with everything you're up to, but you might not be somebody that one would think would necessarily be interviewed on this show. So... <laughs> Uh, it's cool because I think, you know, a lot of people have had some interesting experience as, and have some great beliefs and you wouldn't normally think it. So a little bit about you. Where are you uh, right now? Where am I talking to you from? I'm in Sacramento, California, which is about an hour and a half um, east of San Francisco, smack dab in the center of the state. Very good. And I'm uh, totally opposite um, coast from you. I live in exactly. Massachusetts and I'm just... I don't know, maybe five or six miles from the ocean, not real close, but, um, Which, but here I am. Sandra, I, I am originally from Holyoke, Massachusetts. I know where that is. And I lived on Cape Cod for six years before moving out to California. Mm -hmm. So not a native Californian. No. You don't sound like a Massachusetts girl, though, nor do I. I know. Isn't that bizarre? I know. So let's hear a little bit about you, and um, how do we start this, Deirdre? Do we start okay. with why why you wanted to be on the show? Well, the why is always a good place to start, and okay. that is because I was struck magnificently by your quest for hearing stories and learning uh, information about people's experiences throughout the world, and I give you a tremendous amount of credit for that pursuit. It's Fabulous and absolutely fantastic. Thanks. Yes, you're very welcome. And uh, the why would be, you know, we often have a tendency to disregard our hunches. I have my whole life, and this is yeah. the year of listening to the hunch. And, um, you know, I've always had a very sensitive nature about me, very sensitive about energy around me, which yeah. really kind of leads into the conversation about, the different stages of energy you admit in your life, including upon nearing death, near-death experience, death experience, and post-death experiences. And um, so as far as energy goes, and me being sensitive, um, just a really quick overview, I smell everything. I'm so sensitive on every level. I'm kind of like a hyper-sensitive uh, in, in so many ways. Like I smell things before people can smell them. I hear things that people can't hear. And the biggest one for me, biggest, biggest, biggest is I actually for years avoided crowds and I never understood why. And it was a, a amazing hypnotherapist friend of mine that explained it. And she said, when I went for an appointment, she said, Deidre, your energy is the biggest energy field I have ever experienced. You're so big around yourself. And I went, huh. And she said, you know, that can explain a lot of the things that we've talked about in the past. And um, it, it, when she said that, all of my assessments about everything just became became fundamentally known to me at that moment. 
all the reasons why I can't be in a crowded room, fairs and festivals, sh- uh, shopping, crowded shopping malls. And that's because as people walk by me, I go way past the 18 to 22 inches of energy field. I'm like about three and a half to four feet. And so people are passing through my energy field. And secondly, I'm a giver. I give and I care to give and I care about people. So I'm always giving. My energy is always out, out, out. And there are, let's face it, a lot of people who receive energy and sometimes don't always give it back or they don't always give back great energy. So with that said, and to, to circle back to what I said at the beginning, I um, just disregarded hunches because I knew I was sensitive and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to drive myself back crazy right, right. If, you know, if I keep assessing these hunches and ah, uh, so I tried to ignore them. And I realize now that they weren't hunches. They're, they're truth life experiences about exchanges of energy and I'm assessing them at the time while talking with people. I can feel their energy shift. It's not just a guessing it was a knowing, and I, I really have a kind of a sad feeling for myself that I disregarded that knowing my whole life and Can didn't I, allow it to. I want to in, 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 nicely interrupt you just for a second because, um, no, no, it's not because of you. It's just because I think this is important to put in. I, in the very beginning of my exploration, thought people with, that would talk about energy were like, weirdos right so I, yeah. I kind of would would tune it out and just for anybody that this is kind of new for um, you know science has proven we are all made up of energy and even around us right now most of us have uh, radio waves and television signals and GPS signals and wireless internet mm-hmm. and it's just and, and even um, yeah music you hear whatever it, everything is energy bouncing around everything even what we're made up of and if you've ever had an experience of going someplace and um you know you'd feel what you would maybe describe as oh bad vibes you know or you hear that expression <laughs> right or or that person's got good vibes and a lot of times like i even was saying that expression not knowing what that meant and so right. the vibes meaning vibrations vibrations of energy so i think what deirdre is really saying uh and obviously correct me if i'm wrong but you know you're picking up on energy of m- more um powerfully than most of us like sounds are extra loud to you smells are extra smelly to you um people you know that good vibe or bad vibe um Mm -hmm. you know you'd pick up on it and like it's really turned up like so much so that you you couldn't stand being in crowds that was what you mean right i it is exactly what i mean okay and if anybody guesses second guesses that if anybody who has a pet knows that pets know their uh, pet friend's energy like crazy. Like dogs know you're leaving the house long before you even know you're leaving the house. Oh, my cat will get on my suitcase even before right. days. <laughs> and not, and I'm not kidding. She'll crawl in or you know on top before I um, like days before I even start packing. It's so bizarre. exactly because it's the energy that you're putting out, and it's amazing. So, anyways, that, anyways, that's back just to a you. Little yeah. articulation about the sensitivity of it. Yeah, and, and to and also like we all do have gut instincts and, and intuition and stuff, and paying attention to that. So, continue on, my dear. Okay, so with that said, um, so just a little hunch, a, a little um, note. Just if you do start to get these hunches and they repeat themselves and you might find that you fall into patterns um, of being overly sensitive towards something. Pay attention to that. Don't disregard it. I really, especially young people, because if you start young and become really well grounded in that sense of yourself, it's going to give you so many more clues in life about directions, north, south, east, west, yes, no, maybe, mm. um, much more grounded. So anyways, to get on to the real story about my uh, direct experience with death is uh, my mom's particular experience, and she died seven years ago, and um, Sorry. She, I mean, I know oh, what well, happens, you. but moms are very dear. Yeah, she died, as far as I'm concerned, pretty young at 60. Oh, boy, I'm forgetting what age she was. That's, That's right. Good. My mom's 72, <laughs> and I still think she's young. So, Well, here's the, the real interesting aspect of it is my mom had a terrible disease with ileitis and colitis, and it was a really monster, monster occurrence of disease. Back in 1980, uh, 
75, 76, 77, 78, mm -hmm. lasted for a lot of years. And she was originally in Upper New York State, and she ended up in the hospital, and she came back to Massachusetts, and <clears throat> um, she was very, very sickly, in and out of the hospital. And on three occurrences, she legally died, three separate times during this really ill state. Wow. The last time that she died, um, I was actually at the hospital leaning on the viewing window in ICU with my head against, my forehead against the glass, telling her that it was 100% okay for her to pass at this time, that she had showed enough struggle and enough persistence to want to survive, and she had had her fair share of pain and um you know, uh, disappointments and illness and, and, and that way, so that it was time for her to flow on to the next transition of whatever there was and wherever it was that she would be going. And at the time, I wasn't quite settled in on knowing whether we, you know, continue on or whether the lights go out or, you know, what right. happens, what stage and how long. And at the time, I was raised Roman Irish, Irish Catholic, so there's purgatory and there's heaven and there's hell and right. maybe different stages in between. And I had no idea what was going on. But I, I felt like, you know, me being her closest um, relative and person in her life, giving her permission might help, you know, springboard her. And instead, <laughs> she said, no, it isn't time for me to go. I still have something left to do. And she st stated clearly wow. after she came back that she didn't know what that was. There was just something important was still needed to be done. And so she came back, and now to know what she came back from is crazy because what had happened was all of her organs shut down, and they had her on a tracheotomy life support mm -hmm. system, the whole entire thing. They had tried a new drug on her that basically immobilizes you because she, uh, um, besides being injected with, um, with uh, 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 oh my gosh, the things to knock you out, whatever it is, like horse pills, I don't know, right. um, she would still wake up and try to get out of bed. Like her head wasn't in the business, but her body was still trying to, to shake this off. And so they immobilized her. And they said she's probably, if she comes back, she's probably going to come back, um, you know, quite disabled. Um, probably unable to walk, not thinking clearly, she'll never work again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I said, Mom, just go. Just right. go, right? And um, so she came back, and slowly she recovered, and I was amazed that she even recovered, let alone made, made it back. But not only did she recover, but she did walk again. She did grow her mind back effectively. She did go to work. And I was excited at that point because wow. I thought, oh. She does. She has a magnificent job to do, and I'm not right. sure what it is, whether it's to inspire others, whether it's to inspire one person, and if that person maybe doesn't even cross her path for 50 years, it's none of my business, right? Right. So, uh, so finally the day comes, and she comes out to California with me. We came out 20 years ago, and um, she struggled. She had a, a really horrific struggle about a lot of things. And for anybody out there listening who has a parent, whether you're male or female, and it's your mother or father, that it is very uncomfortable to watch your parent struggle. Yeah. It's just uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's worrisome, and it's stressful. And the yes. stress doesn't go away. It's not like one day you're, you're worried about it and the next day you're not. It's like a, a lingering feeling and, and vibe that you carry with you. And it becomes to, tends to become bare, uh, you know, un, a little undaunting. You oh, know? it's scary. Very, very, very scary. Yeah, my dad it had cancer scary. and um, he went from ultra healthy and bicycling 20 miles a day to uh, – broken back because of a tumor to being oh. in bedridden with a pain pump installed in him and all kinds of things and then deteriorating wow. with cancer and holy cow it, it oh I feel for you I know what you mean and it's really difficult it is difficult. And then there's also another additive is that if you happen to be a parent who is taking care of a child and a parent at the same time, oh. <laughs> that's the holy smoke of the universe for as far as being on, on this planet. Um, it was really interesting because uh, there's all variable stress factors involved in that. So my mom was worried about me. She got diagnosed with cancer, and, and sadly, because of her former ill experience, you carry that, that pain body with you for the rest of your life. And so she always was thinking around the corner, 
the diagnosis. She always was thinking, I'm, I'm going to get something, you know, because it's hard not to when you've come from that, you know, pain place. And um, so she kept saying it, and, that, and she kept going for checkups, and she was fine, 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 and all of a sudden, her confirmation was realized, and she did have uh, rectal and um, colon cancer. Oh, boy. And here's the deal. We found out, okay, so, so my mom coming out of the three um, near-death experiences said, never again. I'm never going into surgery. I'm never, ever going to try to desperately save my life again. So we had a, you know, a, a non-horrific, um, I mean, a, you know, non-resuscitate uh, order. Yeah. And I was very firm and very content about administrating it. There was no gray line there for us. We were definite because I watched her pain. She watched oh, her pain. Right. She felt it. We knew. Right. Yep. So, so when the doctor told us, he said, here's your course of actions. And my mom and I just looked at each other and smiled, and the doctor shifted uncomfortably, and he said, what's going on? And, and we just said, there's just absolutely we have no interest in, in pursuing this life on, for her duty on this planet as we know it. And he just looked and he said, okay. And it was like, it was just wonderful. He could see in us that there isn't a thing this man's going to say that's going to change our minds, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I, w I was caring about my mom's uh, mental health at that point, so I was making sure I wanted to get by with her and say, okay, are we sure again? Let's check in with this again. So she said, no, she's sure. Well, at the time, they gave her a year and a half, and I thought, oh, my goodness, that's plenty of time. We can go visit her family, and we can go to, you know, go in the woods and watch waterfalls and do all kinds of really wonderful things. Mm -hmm. But my mom started to see the stress factor hit me. And so she had another appointment. A couple of weeks later, we went in and they said, you know, Judy, um, it's actually a lot worse than we originally had, had noticed. And oh, this is wow. why. And this is the type of disease it is. And this is what we think is going to happen from this point. And we're like, well, so what does that mean? She, he said, you probably have about three months, six months at the most. And he said, those last few months are not going to be pretty. Oh. And that was yeah, and that was going to be the, the, the strike for my mom because I know she did not want to go through that pain by no, experience again. So, no, Right? So, uh, so we said, okay, the, the mom, that's three months of pretty decent, you know, moving forward from here, pretty decent. We'll figure it out. We'll figure the other part out from here. Let's go do this, this, and that. Again, another appointment in a couple of weeks, and they said, Judy, this is so rapid, it is so rapid, and we're sorry if we've misinformed you, but you have much less time than that. Mm. And I looked at my mom, and I realized she's making this happen. Wow. She did I, 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 I just looked at her, and I said, because that's a powerful woman. To have come back from what she had come back from, right. that's a pretty powerful woman. And then I know she can make this happen. <laughs> now be rapidly deteriorating. Yes. Exactly. And almost two weeks from that day, she was passed away. And, and uh, so here's the beat up, beat up on me was I didn't expect that. No. And I, didn't, I never dreamed in a million years it was going to happen that way. And I had paid $80 to go to a Halloween party. And she was dying. And I right. thought, she's not going to die yet. They gave her lots more time than this. I'm going to go to this Halloween party. I spent the money on it, right? <laughs> did she die when you were at the party? Is that where you're she going? She did not. She oh. did not. She died that night. I had gotten back to her. Okay. okay. And that night I came home. I left the party. I got to the party. I wasn't there 45 minutes. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Okay. I'm not having any fun. I'm not going to have any fun. I'm basically slightly neurotic. And so I'm just going to go back home to my mom. I laid in bed. And this is the first time I laid in bed with her this whole entire time. I mean, of course, I've held her and held her hand yes. and, you know, but I laid in bed with her and this is going to be tough to tell. <laughs> but That's anyways, okay. I, 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 we, we do. <laughs> cry because you know what that's the, the amount of our pain I know and our tears really signifies to the degree to which we can love and I think that's one of the reasons we're here on planet earth is love 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 and so um you know what I've lost my dad and I I'll very often cry when I talk about him so just do your Thank best you. and uh you know what emotion's a good thing so Thank you for that moment. And, man, uh, you just really made me feel so brilliant that the uh, level of emotion equals the amount of love. That's beautiful. I love that. So I held her, and that night I said goodbye to her. She wasn't, hadn't passed yet, but I said goodbye to her. And I went to sleep on the, a little pull-out um, sofa, and when I woke up, she had passed. Mm. 
And it was the greatest time and the very worst time at the <laughs> very same minute. You know what I mean? Sure. Okay, so so we were prepared for it. And we um, had everybody on standby. Hospice had come to visit. And uh, uh, fortunately, she was pretty you know, kind of tanked out on morphine. So, um, you know, I, I'm positive it was not a painful experience for her. But I know my mom in drugs, and I know she talked to herself through even the heaviest of medications. Yes. So so she passed early, early that morning, maybe sometime in the middle of the night, not exactly sure, but uh, not too long after that. And this is where it gets really interesting. I got a call from a psychic that my mom knew, that I also knew, that we both didn't know we knew together. Oh, so you know this person and she knew her, but neither one of you had ever talked that you both both knew her. We both had not confirmed in any way that we knew her. Okay. So when she called, I said, Nancy, it's Nancy Matz. Nancy, what's what's going on? She says, I got to tell you something about your mom. And I go, what do you mean? And, you know, now I'm in this, like, you know, a couple hours after the realization of her passing and everything. I'm like, what, what, what? My, your mom told me I had to call you immediately and tell you that she is so happy. She is so unbelievably happy, and this is what she wants you to know. She's not only happy, she's twirling with delight. Oh. And, I, and I, I laughed hysterically because that would be something exactly that she would have said, right? And she said she wants you to know she's got her arms open wide and she is spinning and more importantly she's ascending while she's spinning and she's squealing with glee. Oh. That's so <laughs> and I was sweet. like, oh my gosh. So my mom sent you Nancy because she knew I needed to hear this. <laughs> That's incredible. It was incredible. So I went outside immediately just to look up into the sky to see if I could get catch a glimpse of her. Right. <laughs> and I looked and I looked. Beautiful birds went by and the clouds were sailing by. The uh, She was an amazing gardener. So here I'm in her garden and there's flowers blooming. There's a, 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 a beautiful breeze. It was like a late, late um, autumn rose bloom in her yard. And, and I just stood there and I was like, my mom is free. Oh, my gosh, Sandra. I cannot begin to tell you if you were to ball all of that intensity and emotion of me worrying about her and having, you know, seen her die three times in, in our past together and her resolution and her stress and her struggle, you know, for years before she died, she just was so stressed out all the time. And to see that just dis, 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 dispensate, whatever you say, into the universe in such a exhale sort of way Mm -hmm. and a breath, a fresh breath and a a positive breath. So at that point on, I celebrated. I celebrated her freedom. I wasn't necessarily able to celebrate my loss. (laughs) No, no, no. That's uh, (laughs) that's something different. (laughs) That was was a big difference. And I got to tell you, because I had been exposed to experiencing the possibility of my mom dying years ago and this experience, I thought I was going to have it in the bag. Oh, yeah. I I have it handled. (laughs) You're funny. Gosh. You know what? It just shows how much, how little we actually know about grief. We can't choose to do it or not or say, well, I was this close before. Well, I've lost somebody else, so I felt it. So, no, it doesn't work that way. That's why, truthfully, no. I've been on such a gung-ho, like, darn it, people people have to know. And anybody listening right now, yeah. I have that free audio, survivegrief.com. You go there, you just press play. And um, even if you've had a loss of another kind, loss of finances, but we cannot control the grieving process. We It's like Ooh. we lose something we, we love and it. You know, it's it's a chemical reaction that we no longer have our fix of whatever that is or whoever it is, and your body grieves. So continue wow. on, Deirdre. Yes. And what was that dot com again? Survivegrief.com. Got it. Because I love what you said. It's we, The grief doesn't necessarily have to be come, come from a lo- losing a loved one. It's losing an occupation or a dream uh-huh. or a... A, a, a negotiation, right? Or before, you know, when your mom found out she was sick, not only you grieve, she does, the other family members do. It's just anytime there's a radical loss or a impending 
loss of some sort. You know, um, we human beings get very comfortable in our surroundings and, you mm-hmm. know, we pull the rug from underneath us. It takes something for our brain to readjust to the new reality. And, it, you know, the word we use is grief, but with it comes a whole hell of a lot of side effects. You know, all that pain and suffering and sadness and memory wow. loss and confusion. I mean, these are biological things happening in our body. So as much as you thought you already had it handled and you'd be fine, like the body's going to mm-hmm. go through it and the mind's going to go through it regardless of what you have to say. So continue on. I didn't mean to interrupt you. but No, not at all. This is a phenomenal conversation. I'm absolutely thrilled <clears throat> from so many perspectives. And because I am an artist and um, I do believe that we paint with our souls. Well, that's beautiful thought. Uh, Oh, thank you. Um, I stopped painting. <laughs> and my mom, she was the biggest cheerleader for my art in oh, my career. For yeah. She was. I mean, it'd be pouring rain. I'd have an art show. There'd be nobody there, and my mom would be sitting there. <laughs> she was awesome. So she was a real supporter, but I stopped painting. Um, and so I'm glad to say, literally this month, I just made a declaration that um, – I had stopped painting not just because of my mom's passing, but because I had some projects I really needed to get done and I really needed to be focused and I, I didn't need to be um, uh, tossed over into different directions. And it, it, I later re- realized I was completely wrong about that and I needed to completely keep painting so I can completely stay sane right. to get me through all these other <laughs> objectives. But anyways, I now know that. But I am going to go back to painting and it just so happens um, coincidentally upon this conversation that my biggest inspirations over the last few weeks when I contemplate going immersing myself back into the world of painting all came from conversations I've had with my mom. So this is oh, nice. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And so she died October 28th. From what year? Uh, that that year. That's the poor death certificate. Oh, yeah. No, that's all right. But it was a while ago. It was, it was seven years ago, yeah. And um, so it is this time of year, I think, that I probably get the most um, – and her birthday uh, was also coming soon, early in November. So that's another, you know, aspect of it. So this time of year really brings a special thickness. Mm-hmm. If I, I, I'm trying to come up with a word to say it's not an oppression. It's not a sadness. It's not a levity. It's just a thickness. And it's, I guess that's probably just an awareness, you know. Right. And so if for no other reason I had my mom's legacy to live by, that she decided when she was going to live, and she decided when she was going to die. And if a person could decide that in their lives, I can decide to do anything. That's pretty powerful. It is pretty powerful. And that's kind of set me on my quest. Uh, the sadness of my mom's struggles and her not being able to st- st- uh, dig her heels into her own greatness and become what she always felt or dreamed she should become made me realize that there's probably millions of other people that are suffering and sad from the same discontent. Oh, and I, you know what? Yeah. I know, I know we're going to hear about what led into what you started doing because of that, but mm-hmm. you know, literally it really can be of the moments of our pain and agony and sadness that we get our life's purpose. And, and sometimes mm-hmm. you don't see it right away. Um, but but take a look, you know, when we start looking at what we repeatedly do and looking at our past. And, you know, um, Deirdre, my book came out of when dad died. I never thought that was going to happen. And, you know, my life has now taken a whole different direction, uh, you know, mm. because of that. So let's hear from you after you had that realization. And not only that, your mom, you know, didn't fulfill on it. And I, I say she's fulfilling on everything because she's still by your side is what my instinct she is. She is. And I'm not going to say she did not complete what that thing was she needed to accomplish. And it might have been something as small as a smile in, in, in someone's hopeless face. Okay. Or raise her magnificent daughter. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I so uh, I thought to myself, what is the connection to some of the things I'm struggling with and why I'm not achieving and standing in my greatness to why she didn't. And I thought back about it and I thought, you know, we were both pretty pigheaded, okay? Mm-hmm. And we both had pretty dramatic experiences in our up- upbringing. I won't go into the detail now. Um, I do tell that some of that story, some of that story in uh, a book called Conversations That Make a Difference, Shift Your Belief, and my chapter is called um, Armor of Wisdom. 
you know anyway. who else has a great chapter in that? Me. <laughs> Oh, are you, that's how we're connected. Sandra. You know, isn't it funny? <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, I'm on Facebook. Sandra Champlain, be happy to be your friend. And I really wanted to know who has some great stories. And so I put out messages in all the groups I belong in. And and truthfully, Deirdre, I like I remembered your name, but I'm like, why why is this so familiar? <laughs> and then so we're back and forth. And then when I'm looking at um, your bio and how we're connected. I'm like, she's another one of the authors that um, put a chapter in this Conversations That Make a Difference book. So you're awesome. For those who are listening, um, when you go to we don't die radio.com, there's a picture of Deirdre Trudeau, and beneath it are definitely the links to um, her business that we, we just mentioned, but also I'll put a link to the book um, that we're both in. Yeah. Isn't that I'll funny? I'll give you the. Uh, the link to my conversations book page because it comes from my sp- perspective as it leads off to all other 38 a- authors. Oh, isn't that awesome? Perfect. Yeah. Well, so that's great. Okay, that's cracking me up. Okay, I know. We've got that connection I know. together. I know. And I totally okay, interrupted so. you again. Yeah, you know who else is in that book? Me! So, <laughs> you do, what you were saying <laughs> is that you do write about that experience in your chapter of the book. It's, it's one of my more um, commanding life experiences, one of the experiences that made me stand up and take notice about life and what was going right. on. So anyway, so then I thought, okay, my, my, my particular upbringing is that my mom did not raise me. I, my grandparents and my father did, but my mom could not do anything wrong in my eyes for as long as I could live. It didn't matter. And when she did want to come back into my life, she became ill, very, very ill, and like for 10 years. And so I only really knew my mom in her pain, sickness, uh, body, until, of course, she recovered. Right. And so I got the link there. I started to look up, what does it mean when you're not raised by your mom? And I was re- reading all these things about what ha- ha- has a tendency to happen to a, a, a child that's, we'll call it abandoned. I don't mean any disrespect to my mom, but that's no. the terminology they use, okay? When you're abandoned by a mom at this age, these are the symptoms and the, uh, the uh, actions you may decide to take from this within this year of time, this year of time. I read my life in that description. I made all of those exact decisions, all of the wrong decisions to make, okay? And I thought, well, you know, there must be a lot to that, um, you know, having a mom to guide you. Like, you know, going down when you're bowling and you have those um, those cushions in the in the gutter lane that keep your ball from going down yes. to the gutter. Uh-huh. <laughs> so when you lose your mom at a certain time, I think you lose your cushion in the gutter in the gutter zone, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I thought, okay, it's little corrections, and and I know this is going to sound like a word connection, but elephants, elephants teach their young. They teach them about their ancient wisdom the whole entire life, and they have long lives. And um, when poachers started to kill off um, elephants for their tusks, their young were raised um, alone, and they were horrible acting. They stampeded uh, villages, and they were um, uh, uh, gashing humans, and they were flipping cars over. But when elephants that are raised with their family behave very well and, and are very content in their in their life. So mm-hmm. the, the, do, you, do you get the equation that I'm making? I do. Uh, okay. So, so I, this is what I say. I was raised by wolves, and I ran in the jungle, and that's what I did. And um, when I realized it was because I did not have my mom or, let's call it, mother's or woman's wisdom, Right to guide my guide my my rampages. Um, I made a lot of bad decisions, and I learned life. I decided, I guess, I learned life the hardest way possible, and that made me realize wisdom shared is really the guide for people to walk towards their greatest successes and their greatest dreams. To walk into their greatest dreams, and if we have these experiences and we don't share our wisdom, we're just basically inviting everybody else to suffer as well. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I never thought of it that way, but that is definitely one of the impacts people get from listening Mm -hmm. to these uh, episodes and everything you're up to, too. So it's very important to share. 
It is important to share, but it's also important to seek, and that's what I was not doing, and that's oh, what my mom had not done. Oh, gotcha. Okay. We we thought we knew everything, right? So, and then and then because I didn't really have a lot of women's influence, I didn't actually appreciate women very much because I didn't really know what the virtues or values were. So I basically unappreciated them and was kind of going about life more the way boys would, my brothers, and I uh, and I and I say that with all goodness, but they're different. They're rough and tumble, and they're just different. They do things differently, and they go about life differently, and they, they um, antiquate and operate emotionally very differently, but I was in their framework. That's how I operated, and it wasn't working for me. <laughs> yes. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, so to, to come circle back around to my personal near-death experience is and, and to, to validate our discussion and every discussion you've had with anyone from uh -huh. their perspective and experience of death is this. Um, my daughter was born in 1981. When she was an infant still, my uh, great aunt was dying in the hospital. And um, I never left my baby's side ever, not for one minute, at least until she was like two years old. Mm -hmm. So I brought her with me everywhere. And my, my grandparents, you know, when you have grandparents, you, you, you sense, you, you want come to an understanding of people dying because their friends are dying, right? Right. You know, they're getting old and they're dying. So we used to always go to nursing homes and all kinds of stuff, and it was just no big deal to me. So I brought Shane, my daughter, and um, we got into it. I found out where my, my uh, great aunt's room was, and I'm holding my daughter, a big, beautiful bundle in my arm, and I come up to the, the doorway, and as uh, my body is stepping through the doorway into the room, where my great aunt was, my little baby started to scream miserably within seconds. Okay. I mean, just out there. Okay. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, did I like, did I pinch her? Did she scratch her eye? I mean, that's how instantly provoked the screaming rage was. So I stepped back out and she calmed back down and I went, that's really weird, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed because it's a quiet ward, and I don't want to disturb anybody with a screaming baby, right? <laughs> so I step back out, and she comes back down. I go, okay, and I look around. She's fine, you know. She didn't poke her eyes out. So I hold, hold her again, and I go to trans, transfer through that door again, and bang, she screams at the top of her lungs, like, instantly. And I'm freaked out now. I've never experienced anything like this. I've never heard of this, and I've never seen it before. No. So I step back out, and she comes back down. <laughs> so now the nurses are kind of getting like, oh, something's really wrong here. And they come over, and I said, um, I really want to go see my aunt uh, and pay my respects before she passes, but um, I can't. <laughs> and they said, well, we'll hold your baby. And I'm like, uh, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm watching to make sure it's a bona fide nurse and they're not going to run out the right. door with her and everything's cool. And, um, you know, they were friendly and there was a whole bunch of people around and stuff, so it wasn't like it, you know. So I go into the room, I pay my respects, I, you know, get, try to, you know, get myself into a solemn atmosphere of thought so I can be present with her. And I felt, you know, obviously that her energy was very diminished. I could feel that, but I couldn't feel what my, my baby infant was feeling, okay? Uh -huh. So I pay my respects, and I leave, and I get my baby, and I said, you know, <laughs> I just got to do this one more time. <laughs> I oh. just got to really... <laughs> try it one more time. So okay. I, I got to try this one more time because I, I walk through, and she starts... I don't even let her get into a scream. I step right back out. And all the nurses by now, you know, there was maybe two or three at the beginning. Now there's six or seven of them are standing there just going... Wow. Okay. And these are nurses that, you know, run the ward of when people are, are um, near death and, and close to passing. And so it was a really huge awakening and experience for everybody. It, 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 it went from the thought that maybe there's kind of a, an energy there to, holy cow, there is an absolute definitive energy there, you know? It has to be. has to be. And, she, and your it daughter really sensitive to it. And Wow. So that was just this, that that's my contribution in helping to validate the hunches. You know, at the very beginning I said <laughs> we all operate by hunches, but um, based on energy transference, they're not hunches. They're very real modems uh, and, and, and of energy and, and um, expressions of energy. And just to conclude kind of in some kind of cosmic aspect is that I have just now in the last two years 
widely embraced that we are and what we are made of is a hundred percent contribution of everything that's ever been created in the universe. And we are a miracle in life. I, I, I would be uh, derelict not to try to express this. Yeah. Uh, the miracle of our humanity and our biology, which means every other living thing, including a leaf, it, 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 the miracle of how the universe was able to manifest this one magnificent moment in the expression of eternity is our planet, our Earth, our humanness, and our divine soul, spirit, sensitivity cannot just die when we do. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so that's pretty much how, uh, how I sum it up and in, in, uh, in how I relate to it. And I think that you can decide to live your life here in the most spirited, celebrated and magnificent way, regardless of uh, negative experiences or, or trials, uh, or you can decide to live it in a, in a very unpresent, unattached way. It's completely up to you. Yeah, and I think, Deirdre, too, everything is energy and these intuitions and these gut instincts that we have, mm -hmm. um, we're fighting, you know, this inner chatter that we all have in our mind and I think you know your daughter picked up on it and the only expression mm -hmm. she had was to scream and cry but yeah, as, she was not comfortable with it no as we grow older it's there's so much busyness in our thoughts and then we get older and older and you know gosh we never stop thinking and it takes being almost in a baby's mind in in this in the like the moment that we can be back in wonder and quiet the mind and be really present um in in the present moment we hear about that all the time but that's mm -hmm. when we pick up a lot about these mm -hmm. this energy and these vibes and things like that and um you know this it really truly is a miraculous world i mean you know again our mind gets real busy looking at our day-to-day -day activities but you know when you think of how we were all created you know like literally and how let's say i'm going to say sperm for the first time in this radio show but the egg and the sperm <laughs> got together <laughs> and um and you know and lo and behold all the DNA and everything's in there to, to bring us into these functioning yep. human beings you know and even like Every a little single acorn you know it, what yeah. it's got in it i mean this is a miraculous world and we you know my, there's no accident that the subtitle in my book is a skeptic's discovery of life after death because i truly thought everything <laughs> everything has got to be what i can see and touch and smell and hear and taste but doing some of the research even within my own book i mean i can't remember what the numbers are but you know our planet earth is is in a solar system, right? Well, mm -hmm. our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy, okay? That has billions and billions and billions of stars. It has billions and billions and billions of stars, and they say like 10 to 20% of those stars have their own solar system. So there are literally mm -hmm. billions of planets in solar systems mm -hmm. just in our Milky Way galaxy. Now, the Milky Way galaxy is one of 400 billion other galaxies in exactly. this universe and that's exactly. that's only what the like the hubble telescope can pick up right and <laughs> when we start to uh get outside of the box and really look at you know that we're on this planet this little marble that's hurling around through infinity mm -hmm. you know it really takes getting outside of our rational mind that thinks we need to see it smell it hear it taste it you know see it or right. whatever the other thing hear it um to make it real so yeah energy is real can yeah I sound so, on something yes ma'am sure about, about being present and this is going to be make i hope a decided difference in in the thought process about the difference between pre being present and being unpresent I meditate every Sunday, and I continue my med meditation into Monday morning. And when I do meditate, the first thing I do is clear everything and become very, very present mm -hmm. in the moment. That's what helps me to really 
peel back the layers, open the veil, pierce the veil, you know. And one morning, it was a Monday morning, I often go on a really nice hike with my dog, and then I settle down and I go into another meditation. And so while I'm in this very present pattern of what I like to do, I was getting ready to put my, um, my pack down, and at that very moment, I had bent over to put it down, and I stopped dead in my tracks. And what do I see? In the fragment of my non-present mind, I would have never, ever even remotely seen this. In my presentness, I saw it as a glaring, a glaring evidence of something. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. What, 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 what was it? I saw <laughs> a hummingbird's feather, gray, muted gray, against gray cement. Okay? I know that doesn't sound like the most profound thing in the universe, but if you could have seen I took a picture, so I have a picture to prove it. It's on my Facebook page, and uh -huh. I'm on Facebook, too, because um, I show my, I put a key next to the feather, and the key is like, looks like a giant, you know, huge thing next to this tiny, barely there feather. And I decided at that moment to meditate on this, uh -huh. that the cells that make up that feather have a universe within them. Yeah, it surely so do. a lot of people think when you have to, when you want to assess the universe going outward, it's infinite, obviously, for obvious reasons. But I think within even the smallest a hummingbird feather cell, inward is equally as infinite. And when you think about that and you want to talk about sperm, that's a <laughs> lot of business going on. <laughs> I didn't say I wanted to talk about sperm. I just brought up the word sperm. But okay. every cell oh. in that sperm brings the ancient wisdom of the entire, I don't even want to call it a universe because I think there's a universe after a universe, so I don't even know uh, what path that is actually described. I in. don't even know either, and I just know that, you know, even looking at our hands right now, inside our hands we have molecules, inside the molecules there's atoms mm -hmm. with the protons, neutrons, electrons bouncing around, and into the tiniest form that we are, like if you try to put an, a camera into one of those little atoms that's making us, making up mm -hmm. us, the camera <laughs> couldn't see anything. All that could be picked up is vibrating energy. So it, it is, is it's called it, cosmic dust. Co I like that. But to mm -hmm. look at us, and I mean, it, it sure does look like we're real and feel like we're real and even how our eyes aren't the ones seeing how our brains work and how our ears work and how we hear gosh if anybody wants to take the time to to research some of that um have you seen the movie what the bleep do we know oh yeah that's a lot of years ago too yeah but if anybody wants to even check that out i mean it's entertaining and it will really give you the wow factor as to we are so then, much more than we think we are and it's miraculous and now they have um, how the universe works, and they are not afraid to go into, um, you know, if the Big Bang and all the other bangs and subsequent bangs and next to come bangs were this, just imagine, we're part of the energy that created those bangs. We are that. There's nothing different in us that, that's different than how that all came about. So, and what's the um, name of that? What the, it's called How the Universe Works. Oh, it's a I have whole series. And, I haven't and heard of that. You, you will love it. Based on listening to your perspective and, and how your mind works, you will absolutely go bonkers over this. It's really phenomenal. And so when you connect it to what the bleep, bleep, bleep do we know, then that makes the human journey even more ominous and magical in taking the uh, soul aspect, the non the non-cellular uh, aspect of our existence in combination with, you know, all that real energy, you've got quite a, quite a um, recipe of I interesting dynamics going on there. Wow. Deirdre, our time's going by real fast. And what I want to do, know. if we can, with everything that you've learned and discovered and felt, how is it that you're now contributing to mankind through your business? Tell us a little Aww. bit about who you are. Because, you know, you can't be this powerful a woman believing these things without somehow sharing it in what you're up to. With, so Without crawling out of my skin most of the time, actually. But um, it's because I'm always so elated and excited, which can be a dream and a, and a, and a challenge at the same time. Okay, so thank you for asking. That's yeah, very sure. generous and very great. Because I'm, I'm looking, I'm just looking at your bio in front of you, easyeye.com and shefluencefactor.com. Like, what the heck is all that? 
Okay, my dear. so uh, the she fluence puts the she in influence. It helps us to explore, tap into, own, and wildly expand our influence to create a more positive impact in our lives, our business, our community, and the world. And people think, people think, oh, the world. Yes, the world, because it starts one vibe at a time. So I'm really glad you and I actually got into the vibe conversation mm-hmm. because um, it's a, a drop in the pond, creates a ripple effect, and it's not your business what happens to that ripple after it leaves your sphere. You just trust the process that if it's a positive drop in the pond, that ripple is going to extend itself throughout the world. I um, am very, very devoutly uh, in, uh, invested in seeing people succeed. And whether it's a two-year-old and a drawing, or whether it's a 55-year-old person starting a new business, um, I have, I think, a unique um, ability to look at everything that that person is um, experiencing and has and needs to know on a global level, and we set, help set people forth on their path one step at a time, but with a big plan. You just can't do the, the whole plan at once. So right. it's called influencing people's success towards their greatest ambition. So with that, we help to open uh, the soul's eyes to the wonders of you and all that is available for you to excel, experience, utilize, and enjoy. Your explorations of discovery represent a magnificent ongoing journey rather than a limiting and finite destination. And that helps to expand on and celebrate your core radiance. Your willingness to be open and accepting of powerful mindsets, beliefs, and practices today will help you fashion a more unique, fulfilling, inspiring, and blissful life tomorrow in order to help other people pursue their dreams and exceed beyond their wildest expectations. So I believe we are all conduits for future success in future generations, and that's how I walk my path. Can you just be an everyday person and get in touch with you and open up this world? Are you more Absolutely. aiming for you're looking you work with individuals, not just like businesses and stuff like that? Well, professionally, as I run my business, I'm a graphic designer and brand strategist. And we kind of take you from where you're at, whether you're a, a decent business ready to take it to the next level, whether you're starting out, whether you're adding a new uh, line to, and, and growth process to your business. On a personal level, that's where SheFluence um, mm-hmm. gets into it. But, but also SheFluence does have a whole professional uh, consulting um, aspect behind it as well. But we, you, you've got to... Um, you know, admit you have to start with where the person is before you can start where their profession is. Oh, that's that's and, awesome. I just know, Deirdre, that I like you. I like talking you, to you. You talked about something other than what your business is. And it's just like, I just like, well, what, what else more are you? Who are you? You know? And so I, I will, um, like I said, link the the websites that you had, had mentioned. And then also the, the link for our book. And I'll get that... Um, the link is it easy to remember the one that takes you to your chapter of the book or is it um, um a you know, I'll send one? it to you in a few minutes is that okay that's perfect so we'll okay we'll look at and we, so also yeah we link don't... through to that but look for the solutions for life uh, uh, morning calls second and fourth Wednesday of every month at 9 a.m go on to my Facebook page you'll see them advertised because that's where we dig into all this stuff we break it down piece by piece cell by cell so if you want to hear more about that that's great yeah and to our listener just remember to go to we don't die radio.com look for Deirdre Trudeau and the links will be there um, by the time you're listening to this the, the the links will already be there in a picture of Deirdre we'll be there too so you know who it is because you know it's interesting yeah. because I I created this show not to try to sell people on anything and it's not like you and I are partners here that Deirdre everybody that goes to your website I get 10 bucks or anything you no. know it's nothing like that <laughs> no it purely, maybe someday but right it really is purely education inspiration we're out for you and ourselves I'm selfish to have the best life possible but there are times that you feel like you resonate with somebody and you want to find out more and so many people that I've met in life and so many of these great um, aha moments I've had are because I either worked with somebody or signed up for a course or bottom mm-hmm. line I'm following my passion so if yes. if Deirdre or one of the other guests resonates with you and you want to find out more 
buy a book or not or read a free chapter or not you know go for it because left to our own devices we human beings can only get so far we need to <laughs> get some of the wisdom if we want you nobody says you have to go any further than you are but um you know miracles can happen at the end of our comfort zone and our comfort zone as comfortable <laughs> as it is it just produces what we already have so learning new things meeting new people trying new experiences that's that's where the good stuff is that's where our dreams coming true can happen um and so i encourage you like i said whether deirdre or myself or or one of the other guests if you want to look them up more and um uh, my that website we don't die radio dot com I have what I call the insiders club and you know I'm kind of slimy by saying this but you actually have to sign up <laughs> so that you know what's in it and I and I don't try to sell you anything but I can tell you I put the best of everything I've got in it for free um, and oh. so I and I just want to give and I want to make a difference in in your life I do that's that's it and what yes. It's all about. Yeah, yes. It's, and someday, yeah, I'm, I'd love to be on a big seminar stage and speaking in front of thousands of people and I'll be able to send you an email and invite you then when that happens. <laughs> but for now, really, you know, embrace what you got and even the people in your life. And Deirdre, are, do you have any closing thoughts? Our, our uh, time is just ending, but I just, just want to say there's something you want to say. Just to say that I'm absolutely honored to be connected with you. You are making my float boat float right now because I asked for this. I asked for the universe to bring me and, and get me across to people that are in my tribe, in my vibe, and, and speaking my language. And you are it. And I thank you very much for you. Oh, thanks so much. This has been fun. And for our listener, I hope you've had fun too, wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And I say this a lot. I mean, as human beings, we have lots of choices and where we could be every second of every day and what we're doing. And the fact that you chose to be here and listen to Deirdre and I right now, it means everything to me. And I, I really hope it's been a value. I encourage you to go to we don't die radio dot com and if you want to uh, contact Sandra and and give me the the ups and downs and goods and bads and what else you want to hear and tell stories of what's happened to you since listening I, I love to hear from you so please do that so again my name is Sandra Champlain I've been your host on we don't die radio dot com I do believe that life is an education for our souls and that all of us our lives here on earth is important so thank you for listening and we will see you soon.